So hello there and uh, welcome to this uh, uh, webinar uh, which is called uh, oddly enough tips for easy unit testing. I forgot to change the slide just to show you how <laughs> crazy sometimes things can get. Uh, this webinar is actually called uh, dealing with legacy code and this is a part two uh, webinar. Uh, it is a continuation of my previous one which I called uh, dealing with legacy code. And uh, today I would like to try something really special and I think something that has never been tried before and in fact I am going to attempt and uh, do some, uh, well, attempt to refactor a, an application uh, which is really uh, complex and it's really hard to test. And hopefully by the time this uh, webinar ends, uh, you will have a clearer understanding and how to approach uh, unit testing uh, legacy code bases. And uh, like I said, this is a part two, which means I am going to touch on things that I have discussed in the previous webinars, but if you haven't watched those, uh, I will uh, try and explain everything that you see. And uh, before we get started, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Igal. I am a developer here at Timeout. And uh, um, we have uh, for you today uh, a uh, two people uh, will win a, uh, an isolator license uh, after this webinar is over. Uh, I believe there will be a poll or a uh, survey sent to you. Uh, those who complete the survey uh, will enter a draw and uh, uh, two lucky uh, winners will get an isolator license. Also, we have an additional isol isolator license for those of you who are active on Twitter and uh, you can use the hashtag unit testing to ask the question and comment on this webinar and one of those uh, lucky ones will also get an isolator license. Now, uh, marketing wanted me to have a lot more slides, but this is the entire slide I'm going to have. I'm going to jump straight into the, uh, the code and I will first explain what's going on and uh, later uh, we will see how we can uh, do something with it. So let me switch to Visual Studio right now. All right, so I'm going to close those tabs and start from the beginning. So uh, previously uh, on this webinar, I wanted uh, an example of a real world uh, quote unquote bad code. This is something that I've, uh, I've, I haven't seen much done in a demo because most of the times when you hear talks about refactoring or unit tests, uh, people can talk uh, a lot about the practices and in the end show you a demo where they can, they unit test a calculator or, or something very, uh, very simple. Something that does not even closely resemble a real world, world scenario. So what I did is ask uh, some of my friends on Twitter for uh, such an example of an application which is, uh, well, to put it in, in, in not very bad terms, uh, bad. So I was given an example of what's one such an application. This is a project, I downloaded it from Codeplex um, and I'm not going to say anything bad about the developers because we are, uh, we all make those uh, mistakes. What I found in the, in this uh, project that I've downloaded, which by the way was an ASP.NET MVC application, which uh, uh, according to the description, uh, which was in French by the way, I had to translate it, but according to the description, it, it was an e-commerce site uh, where you can make purchases and uh, with uh, um, it can complete with a unit tests and it has all cool acronyms like IOC containers and, and it's an ASP.NET MVC3 application so it's fairly recent. Uh, I was wondering why uh, it was classified as a bad code. So I'm not an ASP.NET or even a web developer uh, so uh, I know that ASP.NET MVC has a concept of, of controllers. So what I did was I went to, uh, I downloaded this, I installed this, I compiled uh, and ran all the tests, everything passed. So then I started poking around. So the first thing I did was open the project and went to the controllers directory and I clicked, just picked a first, uh, first class that I saw was anonymous checkout controller. And 
immediately what I've seen, and I hope you can see this on my screen right now, uh, immediately what I saw was that this is a, uh, this is a class, a controller. Uh, it derives from store controller, which probably derives from uh, MVC controllers. And this class takes in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine dependencies to it. So there is some sort of in dependency inversion going on, but in my opinion, and and this is this is you can you can see this without knowing whether it's good or not. You can see this from from the amount of, of parameters that your class takes. You have nine dependencies here. No matter how are you uh, using this, uh, you have to instantiate nine things in which uh, every other thing can uh, instantiate other things. And this causes a lot, a lot of code, of extra code, uh, which is very difficult to debug and maintain and uh, especially test. I mean, this is nice that we have uh, everything here seems to, have, seems to implement an interface which might uh, help us in, uh, uh, mock those things or fake those things. Uh, but again, this is nine dependencies and, and you have to, uh, you have to, uh, to uh, you have to configure each and every one of them. So, uh, having passed this, uh, also, I'm sorry, by the way, I forgot to mention, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask them as we go along. Uh, if you don't understand anything, uh, I'll try to answer them, as well as my colleague, uh, Alicia, who is listening uh, on the other line, and uh, we will try and answer it as we go along. So, like I said, I started scrolling down to see what is it that... Uh, going on here and I will have to tell you I've been practicing this and I've deleted a lot of actions from here this class had a, a really big amount of, of methods which corresponded to each to to a to asp.net mvc action for brevity sake I've deleted all of them except this one called finalize uh, which I will uh, show you uh, shortly but I wanted you to see the amount of code that is that's written in this finalized method. This is this is more or less uh, as it was uh, from the previous time that we wrote a unit test for this. Uh, if you did not attend my previous webinar, we unit tested this method particularly, and it wasn't easy, but in the end, we managed. Um, if you can see, this is just one method, and I am scrolling. I'm currently uh, scrolling with my mouse uh, wheel, and I still don't see the end of it. And the problem is that if I have to explain to you what this thing does, from the name, which is not a very good name, finalize, uh, and by the way, I am this time using ReSharper. I previously had it turned off to show you some somewhat an out of box experience, but for things that I, I am going to do, I would I need all the help that I can get, and uh, Resharper was one of such things that helps. So, a finalize is not a good method because a, a void method called finalize corresponds. It's uh, generated by the CLR if you're using a destructor uh, syntax, uh, and it's not good to have this. Uh, method declared uh, manually in your class, so we'll see what we can do uh, with this. I would maybe rename it to finalize order. Uh, in fact, I am going to do this right now. I'm just going to press F2, uh, which is a resharper's key for rename. I'm using uh, the IntelliJ key bindings, uh, so I'm just going to rename it first to a finalize order, and this will go and rename some stuff. Let's hope I didn't break anything. Uh, right. So, uh, without really going on into much details, uh, you can see that this thing talks to a cart and tries to get a cart based on the current uh, currently logged in user. If the cart is null or the items in the cart are uh, there are no items, it redirects to the home page of the store. Uh, if there is a uh, there is no delivery or billing addresses, this redirects to the checkout page. And if the card did not accept the store's conditions, probably uh, this is probably some terms and condition things. Uh, then you are going to the checkout confirmation page. 
After that, there are some uh, validation rules, and if those uh, are if those exist, they are added to the model state of the of the controller, and then redirected to another ASP page. Um, after that, there's an entire sea of logic that deals with the fact with the case where a user is uh, null. There there are no uh, there are no uh, um, no user logged in currently, uh, so this is so. From what I can see, and I haven't really uh, been too uh, uh, too deep in, into this, but I can see that it tries to create a registration from the visitor ID, and if that doesn't exist, so there's nothing to do. But if, if a registration exists, whatever that is, it copies the billing address from it, and then it goes and creates actually creates a user saves the cookie for it, uh, publishes an event that such a user was created, uh, catches oddly an exception that might occur here, uh, and then copies these things to the cart, uh, closes the registration, does a lot of things that happen if the user is null. In, in my opinion, this entire thing does not belong here, uh, and we will see what we can do to, to uh, to try and and, and relieve this uh, logic from this place. After that, you get you select the payment type again from another service, and uh, then you check for errors again. And in the end, you have this uh, transaction going on in which uh, a tax is added. Again, all all I can try and deduct from the method names and and the the comments which are in French. So it looks like it calculates the taxes. Uh, I have no idea what this is, um, but it says process export, so it apparently it does something to the cart and the user. It may be, it might be uh, an external. Uh, if you, if any of you speaks French, I would happily. Uh, <laughs> if you can help me translate this, I, I, I will be glad, gladly uh, explain what this is. In the end, you have this. Uh, uh, you have this line um, that says uh, it's, it creates order from cart. It, cre it takes a cart, and the user creates an order object from it. And using a transaction, it takes this order and saves the cart into some cart service, and does other things that I'm not even going to bother explaining. So. Just by trying to explain what this entire method does, uh, it took me about 10 minutes. So this is this is a lot of code to try and explain, especially if you if you new to this project or any code which you might have inherited um, from an other other team and uh, or other I don't know maybe this code was developed outsourced, uh, developed outside your company, and now you inherited it and you have to maintain it and the original uh, developers are gone and you really have no idea what's going on. So your only choice is try to read the code and understand what it does. And uh, the problem is it's very difficult to change if you don't have any, any safety net, any unit test to help you along the way because you might really break some stuff. So that's what I did previously. I created an anonymous checkout controller tests in which I created a unit test which forced its way to having this uh, finalized order uh, passing. What I did was I, I, I selected randomly one aspect of, of, of this entire finalized order method which I wanted to check and that was the fact that the cart service dot save was called. So if you if you can see again uh, somewhere here at the bottom where the actual transaction is happening, a, an order is created and whatever whatever uh, causes this to happen, a cart is being served saved in the cart service. Meaning that if we reach this place, this means that everything else was uh, in fact. Uh, everything else was in fact uh, working that means we didn't have any validation errors and that the user existed and uh, lots of other things occurred and then 
uh, we managed to save the card successfully. So this is exactly what this unit test uh, sort of did. I will, I will, uh, I will uh, let you know exactly what this is in, in a minute, but in the end, I used the isolator API and again, uh, this is a rather advanced talk, so if you're not familiar with the isolator API, I uh, go into much greater details in my previous webinars, you will get links to those at the end. Uh, this is called an, a verify API and this allows you to do, to check on an object, on any object at all, on any method, whether it was called, whether it was called with certain arguments or whether it was not called at all. So uh, this, this allows you to, to, to uh, verify interaction between different objects. So what I did here, I, um, the test is broken into uh, three parts, triple A, arranged, act, and assert. So um, the arrange part uh, arranges the object under test, which was the anonymous checkout controller. The act part, and I'm sorry, all this belongs to the arrange. We had to, to make certain things uh, behave in a certain way. So, for example, in order to, for this to happen, for the card service to save successfully, I needed, that I needed uh, to make the controller think that it has no uh, view errors, no, no errors whatsoever. So, I made the is valid uh, function return true. Again, I will, I will touch on this uh, a bit later, but in the end, when I called finalize order, and if I can run this test, I will run it using the Visual Studio Runner, uh, although I can use just the runner that I want, so I can see that this test passes, which means that somewhere along the way, all those things, all those lines, has, have caused this code to behave in such a way that it allowed me to uh, get to this place. And it's very hard to do because there are many, many, many points in where we could fail. So what can we do with it? So now that we have uh, now that we have one test that checks that the card service is saved, we we must do something uh, because we cannot leave this code in this state. Because otherwise uh, we will not be practically will not be able to uh, test much of anything else and uh, our tests will eventually become as big as the code itself and you will not be able to maintain both. And you will find out that most of the people usually tend to throw the tests uh, other than throwing their own code. So what can we do here? Well, first we can read the test that we already created and try and figure out uh, what was it that uh, we had to do in order for uh, the test to pass. So let's see, um, we had to, just by reading this, we had to say that the card service get current order card, and uh, by the way this takes in the null because by default isolator does not care about the arguments, uh, so it just uh, checks for method calls. So whenever anywhere in the system somebody calls card service dot get current order card, just return a create card with one item. What I did previously in the previous webinar, I created a card. This is a simple uh, CLR POCO object because uh, this is a model. It doesn't have any logic, just simple uh, getters and setters from what you can see. Uh, uh, mostly are properties, are simple properties. So what I did is just created an empty card, added one item to it created the billing address and the delivery address and accepted the, the conditions. I, I made all of those things to correspond with uh, uh, whatever was required by reading, by reading the flow, whatever was required here in the finalize order method uh, not to get to this redirect. So, um, so this, is what, this is the first thing we had to do. We had to like fake uh, many things, for example, I had to create a fake uh, uh, user, a fake current user. I had, I had to fake this entire thing uh, in order for this to work. And from this I can learn uh, my required steps to, to make it pass. But in my opinion, this is, this is uh, specifying uh, 
things on the, on the two lower level. If my, if uh, uh, if I have to uh, uh, change something here that says, for instance, I can only go uh, forward if my cart also have. Uh, uh, I can only go forward if my card uh, also has a uh, uh, well, another flag set in. Then uh, uh, I would have to add this flag here and go change all the tests that uh, already uh, using this to add this additional logic in. And this will be a lot of maintaining to do. And I have an excellent question here, and I'm sorry because I didn't I didn't uh, stop on this. Uh, part earlier, I have an excellent question here as to why the controller itself being declared as a fake, which is clearly the object under test. You never fake your object under test. So this was a trick I did in a previous webinar uh, to kind of demonstrate to you what can you do in a case where you have a, a, an object which is really hard to create. Here you have a class that uh, takes in the nine dependencies. So instead of creating nine dependencies, uh, for luckily it has all those dependencies uh, as members on the class themselves. They were saved as, as simple uh, properties. So I leveraged uh, Isolator's uh, uh, um, unique uh, ability to create what is called a recursive fake. To those of you who do not know, by default, every fake object uh, that Isolator creates is a recursive fake. Recursive fake is such a fake that all the primitive values like ints and booleans return their defaults. So integers will be zero, booleans will be uh, 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 false, and strings will be empty uh, rather than null. And if you have an object, so if you have A returning B and B returning a string name, so your B will be automatically faked recursively. So you, know, you will never get a null, and um, uh, you'll never get a null, and this allows you to, to, to uh, rapidly uh, uh, try and prototype uh, your uh, uh, tests uh, without doing much of the explicit configuration. What I did here is that I said isolator, since you uh, are able to uh, fake everything on the method in such a way that it will never return null, it will never throw any exceptions, but it will rather create automatic fakes of everything. So I said to I said to it, create me a fake instance of anonymous checkout controller. But if you notice the second line of the test, I want you to when you get a call to the finalize order, that I want you to call originally. I, that means that whenever uh, a call to finalize order is being made in the system, I want you to just call the original implementation instead of instead of uh, doing a fake. So this allows me to uh, execute the logic inside the finalize order method while everything else, every other property or, or uh, method inside this class is giving me uh, fake values. This, this uh, uh, makes my uh, life easier, but it's not really a good practice. Uh, I needed to do this uh, as, a, as, a, as a way to show, um, to show that if you have hard time instantiating an object, there's because it has a lot of dependencies. There, there are tricks Isolator allows you to do, and maybe we'll uh, do a future uh, talk on, on Isolator tricks, uh, which are uh, hardly, uh, which are not really known. So, uh, inst by the way, uh, what I could have done instead of doing this uh, in retrospect, so I could have not create this controller as a fake object. I could could have just declared it. So I could have declared it and I could have said new uh, anonymous checkout controller. Now, isolator out of the box comes with uh, a little uh, thing we call uh, the productivity add-in or IntelliFake. Uh, IntelliFake, IntelliTest, I'm sorry. Uh, and this allows you, with uh, using a, a simple shortcut, to create uh, fake dependencies automatically. So here I have nine dependencies, so I can just press Alt slash, uh, and it will automatically create uh, uh, fake objects uh, and uh, add them uh, to the to the usings uh, uh, list. So this allows you to create fake objects very easily. 
uh, unfortunately, uh, like I said, this is way too many uh, fakes to create, and you get with a test that looks like this. This is not really pretty. There are ways to deal with those uh, those excessive dependencies, and uh, towards the towards the end, I will show you how. So for now, instead of just creating all those fakes, I will um, well, I place this test into the source control so I can just easily undo uh, any changes that I did. And hopefully just undid this just one file, so I need to just fix it because I renamed the method. Uh, all right, so now let's let's have a look inside let's let's see if we can do uh, something uh, with this method to make it more readable to make it more understandable and and accessible so like I said I'm not a web developer and especially not an ASP.NET programmer so I am aware that there are concepts of validation of client-side validation and you can use attributes uh, to do uh, many of the things that are done here manually uh, unfortunately, I don't really uh, know how to do them uh, properly. Uh, therefore, I am going to use uh, this as if it were any other code. Uh, so I'm not going to use any of the tricks that are maybe provided uh, for me by the, the, the framework. So I'm just going to approach this as if it were a regular, like, data access layer. So I'm, a simple validation will be done with using simple just just methods. So let's see what's going on. I, I need a card. So obviously I could have passed this card from the outside somehow or, or, or maybe expose it as a property uh, because this controller needs a card. It cannot work without a card. But I'll, I'll start with this, with user get user principle. This goes and gets a user out of the HTTP context. Uh, this, is, this is a controller. It wraps the HTTP context instance, and if you're not running on the web, there are ways to mock it or fake it, either with isolator or the out-of-box uh, uh, tools that are provided uh, with ASP.NET MVC. But because we are currently using a fake anonymous checkout controller, uh, we are getting HTTP context faked for us automatically. Uh, I'm sorry, because we are using a fake of the anonymous checkout controller with this trick I did, it's uh, uh, faking it automatically for us. So what I'd like to do, and I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to try and extract this thing because I'm seeing that this is being called from several other places uh, throughout this code. So I'm here another one. So I'm going to just try and create a variable from this. I, I I'm going to. Uh, uh, I'm going to use Resharper here, and it suggests that I have it. This thing is being used from five different places. So it's already a, a, a smell, if you will, that I have something that is being continuously called five times, in which I can just simply create a variable once and just call it user principle without really changing the meaning uh, right now. But at least I have a user principle. Uh, so now what I can do is. Uh, I, I am creating, this is too many vars here, so I'm going to just turn them into the type names so everything is clearer a bit. So we get a card based on the user principle, and then we do some stuff with this card, and then we get the current user, and from my uh, brief, uh, brief experience with this code, I, I am going to need this user a bit later, so I'm going to simply move it a little bit here. Because what I want to do is I want to take this entire thing, like this entire validation logic, and I'm, I will simply use uh, the extract method uh, refactoring. You can have this in Visual Studio itself. Any, any refactoring tool uh, allows you to just select uh, more or less any block of code and uh, extract a method from it. Now, because there are several return points, it's going to be a more difficult, and the method by default, the suggested is, is really ugly without parameters, and I, and I want to avoid it. So you need, you need to, to carefully, uh, you need to carefully uh, choose what you're doing here, but before, before I actually click this, this is what I want to do. I mean, I have several things that redirect to a, a route in case there is an error. All right, so this method returns an action result, and I believe that this entire thing is uh, returns an object which is 
castable or derive, deriving from action result. So I want to, in, in uh, pseudocode, I want to do something like this. If, uh, like, let's say uh, I can do like action uh, result result equals uh, like validate uh, cart, let's say, which takes in some uh, parameters. And then I can say if result is not equal to no, uh, yeah, sorry. If result is not equal to null, then just simply return result. This will allow me to uh, offload this logic to another method, uh, which there will check for all those uh, things that it needs to, and return an appropriate uh, route in case I have I need to go to one. And if not, it can simply return a null. So I can do this using the uh, extract method refactoring uh, by just selecting this and pressing the, the appropriate shortcut. And I will, after this webinar is over, I will go and annotate this video with, with the shortcuts I'm using. So you can do this too. Um, so I wanted to return an action result, this method and it takes in a user in a cart and I will simply name this method um, I'll simply name this method uh, validate cart and I'm sorry I I have tried really I have tried using this with just bare bones uh, tools that come in from Visual Studio and and again this is pushing really tight I, I, I <laughs> it just I couldn't just do it uh, within the time frame so here I have something that's called validate cart and what it does is just doing uh, this entire validation and returning null in case everything is fine. So um, also I've been told that here's another piece of logic that goes in and makes sure that there are some sort of uh, validation rules going on. Um, so uh, it goes into sales service and just goes validate order cart, whatever that means, and gets an, back a collection of broken rules, which is of type, uh, let's see what type it is. Uh, it's a list of broken rule, and then it adds them to the model state, but there is no model here uh, to be set. Uh, so this entire thing does, uh, in case that there are errors, all right, so it redirects to this view, which is uh, located somewhere else. and from what I understand, if I go, if th this thing only checks if there are broken rules, so I don't need to use the model state for this. To my understanding, only the only thing I can do, in fact, is instead of using this model state, all right, instead of using the mo the, the controller model for for checking my errors, I can simply do a, a an if statement. So if I have any broken rules, sorry. There's a link, uh, link uh, extension method, uh, which is called any, and it returns true in case I have any sequence, just any item in the in the sequence. So, if I have any broken rules, simply return. And this thing uh, looks very much like the validation rules that I used before. So I can now just simply take it, and I can go into the validate cart, to the definition, and just simply paste it here. So what I am doing, I'm, I'm semi-manually refactoring, and I am trying to maintain the logic, uh, ma maintain the meaning meaning of the code without really, uh, without without change. I mean, I'm changing the code, but without really uh, altering the meaning of it. So I will just rename this variable to action result, and now I have more or less what I wanted. So. Uh, let me try and run the test and let's see what happens. Uh, let's see if I, what I broke, because I probably broke something. And this is a good thing that we had a passing test previously in, in which I can, uh, in which I can rerun it and see that, that something was broken and, uh, and go ahead and fix it. And unfortunately, this is a chicken and egg thing because you cannot really write a test until you understand your code, and you cannot really understand your code until you're refactoring it, uh, until you refactor or read it enough so you sort of understand it. And it's really easy to do when you have tests to back you up. So this this test, by the way, which we wrote, it's not really a good unit test because it assumes 
it does something unnatural. It, it creates a, a fake out of the object under test, uh, which you don't usually do. But this thing is called a characterization test or uh, like Roy Osharov, who wrote the book on unit testing, uh, likes to call this wishful invocation. I am wishing for things to, to, to just work and see what happens. So this is called a characterization test or exploratory testing. I am just throwing out values and seeing what happen, happens and I am getting familiar with the code uh, and the way that it works. So here I had a flow which is now broken. So if I can see the test result, I can see that my expectation failed because I expected the card service dot save to be called, but it wasn't. Meaning that somewhere along the line I'm getting lost. So let's just put a break. I'll debug this. I'll simply put a breakpoint here and I press debug. And now we will debug the unit test and we'll see uh, whether or not. Uh, it what happened really um, so this takes a few times this is my uh, main development machine this is not a demo machine so I probably have lots of debug symbols loaded um, so let's see I have a principal I have a cart and I have a user all those are not now so let's see Oh, ah, I, I see what happened. <laughs> I see what happened. So I have an action result which I don't don't need. I want this to be null, in fact. But I do have an action result and it returns. And the reason I have an action result is because the trick that we did earlier to make, to create an instance of this class is coming to, I'm so, <laughs> pardon my French, but to bite us in the ass. Because as, as you might remember, uh, isolator fakes every method uh, recursively, uh, which is not explicitly specified. So by extracting this method called validate card, which is just a private method, isolator does not execute. The isolator doesn't care what's he, what's in here. It simply returns a fake action, action result. So this thing doesn't return null. So in order to fix it, there are two things that I can do. Uh, well, there are three things that I can do. I can either not use a, a fake object. Uh, but use a real one with fake dependencies, but I don't really want to do this right now because of the time constraints. I can either make this internal, in fact this is what I'm going to do, I can either uh, leave it as is as a private uh, class, uh, as a private method, and just use the, the isolator non-public API. Uh, isolator non-public API uh, to fake this method, but I can uh, just simply write isolate dot non public dot when called and this is using this is using the same semantics uh, as the when called but without it's not strongly typed uh, this is uh, uh, this is uh, uh, this is one of the reasons uh, not using uh, using non public API is uh, not really recommended because you are using strings and if if you rename things or delete things you are not you do not know about them immediately. So I can either use this and specify the name as a string, or for the sake of testability right now, I can turn this into an internal method. And, uh, and now I can simply say, I can simply say that when, um, what was it, validate cart with, uh, uh, I don't care about the arguments by default, because I, well, for this particular test, I am assuming that my validation did not return any errors. So what I can do is instruct isolators to say when somebody is calling validate cart, just simply uh, return, will return uh, null. Because I don't really care about any of the any of the logic in there. I am assuming that no redirection uh, directives uh, were returned to me, therefore I need you to go ahead and just simply return and 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 return now and continue. So now that I did this, I am uh, running the test again. Hopefully it will pass. Uh, all right, so now it's passing again. So 
I'm changing the logic a little bit. I need to uh, speed this up because I believe uh, we're going to be out of time uh, shortly. And I do have a question here uh, about uh, how come my code compiles if Resharper shows an error here. And this is not really the topic of the conversation, but I'm using Resharper 6 and it can detect uh, if you're uh, using the incorrect view names, which, which it cannot really resolve. And it shows them as an, an error uh, of, of Resharper, but it's not really a compilation error because you'll probably crash this. You'll, this will probably crash at runtime, but I don't really know because I never actually run this. I, I only using the unit test to, to verify the logic works. Um, so now we have a passing test. So by now, all, all I did was offload, offload some logic, some some of the validation logic, instead of like there were 15 lines. How many lines are here? There are about one, two, three, four. There are about 15, 20 lines. So I moved those 15 to 20 lines behind one single method. All I did was group together a, a common logic, a common, uh, so to speak, uh, a concern, and just hide it behind one method. From here, I can do several things. And this this is, uh, I'm not going into it right now, but this is hopefully something that you can, can realize. Uh, Trust your tools. Just use the refactoring tools which you can to, to gradually either rename variables or, or just identify pieces of code which you can extract into methods. Later, you can take this method, this validate cart method, and if you truly think it does not belong in here, which it might very well be, you can put this entire thing into another class, another helper method, or an extension method, and have it, uh, or maybe do, do, do this attribute based uh, as, as uh, uh, Visual Studio, as uh, SPNet MVC allows you to do. Just put this in, into an attribute and, and allow the framework to, to, to do this for you. So you don't have to have it inside your main logic. I mean, this is a complex uh, piece of, this is a complex flow. And what you need to do is you need to to, to gradually make, and this, this is what I insist on, this, you, you need to make those gradual changes uh, until you really understand what it's doing. And only then you will be able to understand what does belong and what does not belong into this entire class. So from my gut feeling, I can say that this entire thing that deals with the user uh, equals null, and it goes ahead and creates the user, I'm saying that this entire thing does not belong here at all. Not to the not to the checkout controller, not to the finalize order, um, uh, and what I can do, I really I can just simply take all this thing and and do the very thing I did with the with the verify uh, verify cart method. I can start by extracting uh, the method. Just simply take this entire logic which has a catch in the middle and does a bunch of bunch of assignments i can take this entire thing try to cr try to do an extract method but as you can see this creates an even scarier monster because no matter what kind of of permutations i do here is i cannot really have something that that looks okay uh, even even after some so to speak refactoring because i have a method that takes in a card and is new customer boolean, and then as an out parameter gives an action result and other other stuff which which are really not nasty. So you have to read this through and understand. So so instead of just going and doing that, I I can see that it tries to create a registration from an account service, and if the registration is null, it goes to the checkout. So if you don't have a registration, because whatever registration is other code here is using it and uh, without registration you cannot really continue so what I would do is I would leave this this check here because it has a return and I would take this entire thing that that uses this registration object and try to extract method uh, on it so it takes in much less parameters and it's still not really pretty, but I, I believe I can work around because it creates a user and it needs to return this user. So let's see if I, if I use a return. All right, so let's try this. 
So if a user is now, it's calling a password function. It's not really so, but let's try and rename it and call it uh, create user from registration. So don't afraid to be descriptive because this is this is what I think the method does. So it takes in a principal, it takes in a cart, it takes in is new customer, which for whatever reason is false. In fact, I'm not sure when this becomes true. And so I can, I can look into this. But regardless, this is what you have to do. And unfortunately, even, even with our tool, which can help you uh, deal with, with many dependencies like statics and uh, code that is not really uh, meant, was designed for testability, so to speak, you will really have to go ahead and do this. Now, by, by creating smaller methods, you can leverage isolator to uh, simply uh, take those methods and just uh, make them return or not return or behave however you want, you want. So instead of just going into the method itself, into this one big method and start changing different conditions, you can simply encapsulate this entire thing. You can abstract this entire thing and just fake it. In fact, uh, uh, right now our test assumes that we have a user. So th I, I don't even want to deal with this thing right now. So I really, I can just leave it as is. Let's, let's make sure I didn't break anything. So I can, I will run this test again. All I did was, by the way, just extract method. And extract method typically does not break your code. So hopefully you will learn to trust it. Extract method is really great refactoring. Uh, just use it, use it often. Don't, don't overdo it because you don't want to create methods that are four lines long, no matter what the book tells you. There are books that suggest this, but in the end you will end up with a lot of methods and you will not have any idea what's going on. Just start small. Just take huge pieces of code, extract, encapsulate them uh, behind methods, and after that, uh, when you're ready, uh, you can slowly divide, divide and conquer. Just keep it, keep it simple. And in fact, you can see what's going on here. In, in the case where I want to test that if a user is no, all I can do is create a uh, a fake I can I can I can have create user from registration return a fake user if I wanted to because this is now a method and the method is callable and if it's callable I can use isolator to instruct it to return any value that I want so uh, in fact this is it I mean Refactoring as something as, as, as uh, I don't want to say nasty, but as something as complex as this takes a team effort, and it doesn't take an hour, it takes a lot more, and uh, you are, in the end, left with less code. I mean, in the end, this will have less code in it. This will call other stuff and will, will, uh, will, uh, will use other stuff, in fact, all, it occurred to me, this, I, I'm not familiar with this code, yes? So I, it, it had occurred to me that this class is called Anonymous Checkout Controller. And what, it, what happens here, it checks whether there's a user logged in. If, if a user is logged in, I'm sorry, if a user is not logged in, it goes ahead and creates the user. But what if a user is logged in? So it goes into the sales service and it, it, it processes the order. So this entire thing seems to me that it handles just a case where a user is null. So it made, it made me think, what if there's already a class called checkout controller which handles this? So I, I, I noticed that this, this uh, controller derives from store controller. And store controller has, um, well, it has many helper methods here, like, like logging, like whatever. But I went to the controllers, uh, uh, controllers directory again, and then I saw I have a checkout controller. And I can see that it also takes nine dependencies. It, it is as almost if it was copy-pasted. I mean, I, I have the exa exact same methods here, like shipping and all those methods. I really, I deleted those because I wanted to, to do this uh, for the sake of this presentation. But I went and deleted all those methods, but in the end, I have a method called finalize, which you can notice, this is a checkout controller. If you'll notice, this does particularly, a, 
it's practically identical to the anonymous checkout control. So this is a, a copy-paste situation. This checks for a